Funding for this program has been provided by the Nevada Mining Association. The Silver State, a name well earned by Nevada in the silver rush of the late 1800s. But as mining has evolved over the last 150 years, prospectors, picks, shovels, drills, and mills have reached a level of technology unimagined a century ago. This is Nevada Mining Today. From, from the onset, uh, an exploration geologist is, is out in the hills uh, looking for uh, you know, prospective prospects. And when they, when they find an area of interest that they believe uh, has potential, um, they'll bring in drills. As they, they drill down into the earth, uh, they take samples, and those, those samples are uh, barcoded. We use GPS tracking um, so that we know exactly um, where the sample came from. Um, from there, the labs will take uh, this, the sample and uh, they'll process it through a bunch of very sophisticated uh, pieces of equipment. So you, what, what, what you see happening here is some uh, uh, diamond drill core that a mining company has taken uh, for most likely a precious metal uh, property. The, uh, the, the client's geologist is here logging the drill core while our technicians are, are helping to sort through it and take samples for various types of testing. So we have the samples have been prepped already. They've been ground to like a flour consistency. And we weigh 30 grams and put it in one of these crucibles. We also add a scoop of lead oxide based flux so that when we put it in the furnace, uh, the lead oxide turns into lead metal and collects all the precious metals and it falls into the bottom of the Fusion. We're determining the concentration of gold or silver in the sample. The ores are processed in the lab in a variety of ways to determine which method will be the most efficient for recovering the mineral. The data that we generate from the, the testing that we do is, is used to design the mineral processing plants that are built in support of mines. As we, we collect this and it goes into a database, there's mine uh, engineering, mine modeling programs, which then begin to map and come up with a 3D uh, ore body. The decision to be an underground versus an open pit is driven primarily about economics. Um, you know, if the, if the ore grade is uh, close to the surface, and is a reasonable grade, an open pit mine makes sense. If the ore body is very deep and the grade is not so great, an open pit mine uh, loses its uh, economy of scale very quickly as you have to move a lot of overburden to get down to it. Um, and so then we, we have to approach it with underground techniques. This machine behind me is a single boom jumbo and the other one behind me is a double boom. On the other side of that's a double boom jumbo. And these are, are for uh, drilling the face. So if you're if you're going down in the mine and you have the face as you're advancing, these machines come in, drill the holes, then they put the dynamite in, and then they they detonate in, and then once it's mucked out, then these go back in and and uh, start all over again. Running engines underground can create deadly carbon monoxide. Today's mines have extensive ventilation systems, and the drill machines have a unique capability. Once the guys get to the, to the heading where they want to start drilling, uh, they actually, they, they turn the engine off and there's an electrical cord back here and they plug in and they run all their, all their functions then off electricity. Uh, so it's not, you don't have those emissions underground so the guys aren't, you know, breathing in the fumes and everything like that. Most of the mining in Nevada is above ground or open pit mining. So here at the Phoenix mine on the north side of the property, we're actually mining the Fortitude pit that you see off to the right here. It typically has our better gold grade. The rock is really, really super hard on the north side of the mine, so it takes a little bit more precision as far as how we mine it and, and get it to the mill. And then on the southern side of the mine here, more towards back towards the plant, we're mining the Bonanza pits, which is typically our better copper grade. We actually have a blast hole drill that will go in when we finished mining one of our benches off. We'll drill 40 foot holes. We'll sample the top 20 feet and the bottom 20 feet so that we understand what the mineralogy is as far as the, 
the gold, copper, and silver grade. We'll send those off to the lab, get those results, and then the powder crew will come in and actually load explosives in the hole so that we can prepare and get fragmentation in the rock for the next bench so we can go in and mine it. Right now, we're just coming up from a shot, so where they blasted the material. So we're just coming up from that, so the, the trucks will start readying up and the shovels will start readying up so they can start resuming their dig process and haulage process. The entire mining operation is run by advanced computer systems and GPS monitoring. Technology is improving, not just the efficiency of the mining operation, but the safety as well. The Aardvark, an odd named device, is used to explore new and sometimes dangerous terrain. The Aardvark is a remote drill that we're able to use, and it actually, the drill can actually be ran from our admin building while the drill is actually up here working on the mine. We can actually utilize that drill in critical areas. Um, a lot of people don't know it, but there's natural voids in the earth that are created by years and years of water running. We, these known areas or projected areas, we can actually go in and utilize this drill and get key information and continue to conduct business and do it remotely. It's over a mile between the aardvark and the computer center that the operator works from. So everything basically he would be doing in the drill, he can do from right here in this air conditioned room. So um, you can see just by a click of the mouse, he's actually operating the drill. Those upper two left screens actually shows the blast hole drill mast, as well as the steel going through the deck. The samples of the ores taken are lined out in a computer program that keeps track of each grade and where it's going, allowing the shovel operator to know the value of the ore at each massive scoop and the driver of the truck to know where to take it. The red stuff is a, it's more of, it's kind of a low grade, so material that would be stored for later process. Uh, your orange is the same thing, it'll go to a stockpile. Your yellow type materials, that's more your high grades. So it would directly go to your mill ore and be processed today, tomorrow, a week from now. And then you can watch it up here as well. You can watch your trucks live. You can see where they're on the map at all times. Tire heat and tire wear are both safety and economic concerns. So we have sensors that they put in the tires. And then, then there's a box that's in the cab that's tied into the wireless network and then that data reports back to the office and then we can see live feed of the different tire heats so we can we can dictate how fast our trucks can run so if in the warmer weathers we'll have we'll, there'll be times when we'll need we'll tell our drivers to you know lock it in fourth gear keep the speeds down so we don't overheat our tires i mean we're having we're having record tire runs up in the 15,000 hour range so our tires are able to run a lot longer. So by us monitoring the different, you know, heats and tire pressures, and it, it's a huge cost savings. More, more life you can get out of your tires, the better you are. Because tires are, are a huge cost. I think the equivalent to one tire is, or equivalent to a case of dynamite per tire. So if it blows, you don't want to be around it. If we do get a hot tire, we have protocol says we need to move it to a secluded location out on a dump somewhere where nobody's going to be around and then we'll send the tire guys out the tire crew and they'll approach it slowly if we need to we'll have a water truck on standby which we usually do and the driver of the truck will stay in the cab nobody on the ground until the professional tire carrier tire handler gets out there to it operating haul trucks that are three stories tall and carry up to 400 tons Required drivers stay very alert at all times. Well, the fatigue monitoring system that's actually inside of our haul trucks, it, it's been a really good technology. So basically what it's doing is it's a camera that's on the dash inside the haul truck and it's taken shots of facial features of the operator that's actually operating the haul truck on the mine site. If for some reason the system indicates that there could be a fatigue event, it will actually vibrate and shake the seat. The operator then is therefore notified and asked if they're okay from our dispatch coordinator. 
and you go through here and you look and you can see the screen that records roughly six seconds. It tells everything. It tells how many feet they went, the miles per hour they were going when it, when it happened. But is what I do is I go through and I confirm that they weren't sleeping or fatigued of any sort. Mining operations require a tremendous amount of power. In recent years, the industry has made extensive efforts to save energy through the installation of more efficient motors and pumps and LED lighting, reducing their power by millions of kilowatt hours. Newmont even has its own power plant to make the 24 hour a day, seven day a week operation more cost effective. Basically, we take our power from here, send it through our 120 kV line out to the Falcon substation, and from there it gets distributed through Envy Energy's transmission system out to our Twin Creeks mine, our Phoenix mine, Lone Tree, and North Area up in the Carlin operations, as well as our operations over at Immigrant and Rain. Basically, the first third of the structure behind me there is where we produce the electricity, burn the coal, and the other two thirds of it's all for emission controls. And that's what allows us to be one of the top uh, best uh, plants in the country as far as emissions. We have the fourth, fourth lowest SO2 emissions and the sixth lowest NOx emissions in the country for a coal-fired power plant. We burn low sulfur coal and it, it's available over in the Powder River Basin in the Wyoming mine, mine area. And we're able to transport it directly on rail from the mines over to here. We run 130 car trains it takes about approximately five days to leave the plant, go to the mine, get loaded, and then come back. So we're able to keep our coal supply here at the plant just running one train continuous, in continuous operation at full load. And we'll actually go through about 110 tons an hour. So we use almost one car per hour at full load operation, which is 203 megawatts. In addition to their efforts to save energy, the industry has also made significant changes in their operations to reduce emissions of mercury during the processing of ore. The mining industry was, did not want to do this initially. Uh, we did have to put some pressure on, and the industry did oppose it. Uh, they did realize by 2004 that it, it's going to happen. There's going to be mercury controls, and they, should, they need to get on board. And so they did at that, at that time. So at the Phoenix mine, first of all, it's really important to understand that um, we do not use mercury throughout the gold processing. Um, it, it actually naturally exists in the rock that we have here at the Phoenix Mine. Throughout the gold processing circuit, there are a couple of areas where we have a very minute amount of mercury vapor in its actual gaseous form. At this area, we direct that um, gaseous stream into what are called mercury controls. These are a series of wet scrubbers and carbon absorption columns, and they clean the mercury out of the air and allow a cleaner air to pass through on the other side. Emissions have gone down significantly. Uh, in 2013, which is the last reporting year, uh, there was like 700 pounds of mercury. That's, a, that's way down from the thousands of pounds we were getting. And uh, you know, once, once, the, once, the, once the industry got on board, they did a good job implementing. And, and I, have to, I have to really put my, take my hat off to the state regulators who really uh, were diligent and uh, worked hard to, to get, develop a good program. High grade ores are determined by the drill core processing during exploration, then are crushed and sent to the processing plant where a combination of cyanide and carbon extract the microscopic minerals. Lower grade ores are taken to what's known as a heap leach pad. In heap leach processing, uh, ores are stacked on a line facility and a dilute sodium cyanide solution is introduced into the ore pile. The solution moves through and contacts and wets particles of ore and in so doing dissolves precious metals, gold and silver. That solution then uh, is collected and passed through carbon columns and the gold and silver are adsorbed under the surface of the carbon particles. That carbon, when it is loaded to a certain uh, concentration, is then removed and stripped of the uh, gold and silver. The mines as well are concerned about losing 
what we call pregnant solution, that would be the cyanide solution after it's gone through the ore. Everybody is in favor of collecting that as much as possible and it would drain from the, the heap leach pad to double line ponds. The liners prevent the cyanide from leaking into the ground. In the rare event of contact with the soil, there's a protocol overseen by the Bureau of Mining Regulation and Reclamation to restore it. They're required to excavate contaminated soil. So if the soil has come in contact with the cyanide solution, it's excavated and usually placed on the heap. Then they take confirmatory samples to make sure that they cleaned up all of the cyanide. And if once they get those results, they backfill the excavation with clean soil. When the unit is no longer economically viable and that all of the precious metal values have been recovered, the heap leach facility moves into closure. And what we look at doing is allowing for drain down of many of the fluids or most of the fluids that are contained within the heap. Those solutions are either evaporated or brought into other, um, other processing circuits, but the drain down uh, brings the residual moisture very low in the heap leach facility itself. Generally speaking, when we have waste, whether it's municipal waste or mine waste or radioactive waste, if it's landfilled, which is near surface disposal, we want to put a cover or a cap over the top to prevent or minimize the movement of precipitation, rainfall or snow melt, from going through the waste where it might become contaminated with the contaminants that are in the waste and move down to groundwater. We're creating essentially a sponge, and uh, my particular branch of science is in some ways you might regard as the physics of a sponge and it's um, surprisingly complicated given the variability that we see in soils out here. Sometimes we have a layered soil, sometimes we have a fine-grained soil, a silty loam on top of a layer of coarse sand or gravel uh, in an arrangement we call a capillary break. Uh, this can greatly increase the storage of the soil above it. Works well as a landfill cover, works well in your garden. In a closed system that is subject to reclamation, you don't want water necessarily to go into that. And by putting a vegetative cover on it, it allows the, the plants to uptake that water and reduces the water uh, that is, is uh, transmitted down through that material. So uh, Bill has been a, a tremendous asset, a DRI, for, uh, for looking at uh, vegetative covers and caps on landfills or mining features. Methods of reclaiming the heap leach for long-term health of the ecosystem are constantly evolving. What you see behind me is an area that uh, had a dozer on it just a few weeks ago. We regraded this slope, and what that means is as the material was placed, it was steep, we flattened that slope to get it ready for seeding. We will seed that this fall, late fall being the, the prime opportune time to seed in this climate. And just to the right of that fresh dozer work, you see an area that was seeded about seven or eight years ago. And that's typical vegetation success for that time period. So we started to reseed this area behind me in 2007. We did some reseeding in 2009 and 2010 as well. On an annual basis, we come back to our reclaimed areas to do what are called vegetation surveys. So we try to look at the area to understand, is the vegetation coming back in a healthy way? Did we miss some areas? Do we need to reseed? What is the erosion looking like? In the case of most of our reclamation sites, we're looking at establishing uh, vegetation that would support wildlife habitat, livestock grazing, and watershed uh, values for that area. So to that, in most of Nevada, we look at establishing a sagebrush grass dominated vegetation. Certainly in some cases we have the opportunity to establish sage grouse habitat and that's an important consideration in today's world if you will with the interest on greater sage grouse and the sagebrush ecosystem. Restoring sage grouse habitat that has been lost to fire, urban development and industry has become a major focus to try to avoid listing the bird as an endangered species. Well, the sage grouse is the, probably the number one or number two um, environmental issue that's confronting the state of Nevada. 
our mining operations. We have ranches that are in the immediate vicinity of the ranch uh, of the mines, and we looked at it and said, you know, we could do things on our ranches that would would help preserve the sage grouse habitat um, that would then enhance our ability for long-term stability on the mining side. So literally we went to the Interior Department and knocked on the door and went in and said, look, we have this idea that we think we could start to uh, do mitigation projects on our ranches that would help restore the habitat for the sage grouse that would uh, lead, lead, let you achieve the goals that you need to achieve as policymakers and let us continue to mine. And that started a year's worth of discussions and ultimately led to what the Interior Department called a historic agreement. I suspect we'll be spending several tens of millions of dollars on this is, is because it, it'll be a long-term engagement. Um, but you know, if we look at our federal government, you know, the, the challenge the sage-grouse has is it's the destruction of habitat. And the, we are in the, our deficit-ridden government, we're just not going to see tax dollars come out to restore habitat. So really there's, there was very little alternative but for the private sector to kind of step forward to help fill the gap and to start these kinds of projects. So ceasing economic activities out there would not solve the issue and it would probably lead to the, bird, the bird's demise. But taking the economic interests that are out there and investing them in the solution will help the bird for the long term. While the sage grouse has for now avoided the listing as endangered, some new federal rules have potential effects on the mining industry. The way we're impacted is that with the classification that we're seeing today, it's showing that parts of our land are classified as habitats for sage grouse. And what that means ultimately, or what it could mean, is that we'll no longer be able to mine that property. We'll no longer be able to even drive a truck on that property. And there haven't been sage grouse in this area that I'm referring to in Clark specifically for a long, long time. So we just know that the classification is a mistake and it's false. And if we can't fix that, it'll have a serious impact for our facility. And it could even result in us having to close down that mine, which would really hurt our business and hurt the economy here in Northern Nevada. An additional concern by some is the effect of the operations on mule deer migration. Mining and, and development has the potential of cutting off migration corridors, which are vital to certain species like mule deer, because when hard winters come, some of our mule deer migrate over a hundred miles. In those situations, you need to look at the sequencing of your mining operations, the scope of your mining operations, the timing of where you put waste or stockpiles to allow those corridors to persist. What we did was identified through um, uh, colored deer studies to define movement patterns uh, was take that information, find out where the deer are moving, look at our facilities, locate them appropriately, striking a balance between operational and economic needs as well as the, uh, the biological needs of, of the deer and positioned our waste rock facilities such that there is a corridor between mine facilities and, and the hill slope where deer can migrate largely unimpeded. Initially, um, uh, we had real concern with Barrick's Bald Mountain Mine. We got involved in this uh, simply because uh, Barrick was refusing to do what we felt was the right thing. Their negotiation team was made up of lawyers. I was contacted then by national managers, possibly international managers of Berwick, and saying, we need to talk. That was the absolute turning point right there, that first meeting. I think one of Michael's first statements was, Berwick forgot that we were supposed to listen. And which I followed that by I don't think there's any issue that reasonable men cannot settle. Some of it was simple things, just affect uh, changing mine designs for berms and things like that so that the deer migration could go forward. 
I also looked at it, I said to myself, you know, we've, we need to do more in this area. Uh, I, I thought that the Defenders of Wildlife had very legitimate issues that they raised with us. Uh, Sierra Club had legitimate issues. And so within Barrick, I've created a, a Wildlife Conservation Council where I have representatives at each of the mine sites that are specifically designated to do what they can to enhance and protect and preserve wildlife at each mine. So what is the result of all this high-tech prospecting? At gold mines, after extensive processing, a bar weighing nearly 65 pounds is poured on site and shipped off for further refinement. Other minerals extracted, such as silver, copper, or gypsum, become some part of nearly everything we use in our daily lives. Our Earth provides us with the essential materials needed for the technology that continues to advance our world, including the modern equipment that makes mining what it is today. On the next episode of the Nevada Mining Series, we will explore the economic benefits to the state, the jobs created, a variety of vendors that provide support, as well as an in-depth look at whether the state is compensated fairly in taxes paid by the industry. Funding for this program has been provided by the Nevada Mining Association.